Thank you. It's pleasant to be back. And a little surprising. What I have here is really a series of snapshots, followed by some cautionary tales, followed by a reason why art matters. At the beginning of Stephen Sondheim's wonderful musical, Merrily We Roll Along, a very successful screenwriter and lyricist is giving a commencement address at an American college. And one of the students asks him, how did you get here from there, Mr. Shepard? What did you have to go through? How did you get here from there, Mr. Shepard? How did they do it to you? Well, when I was 14, I sat in the Isoldo Cinema, Dewsbury, the West Riding of Yorkshire, watching an electrifying Gregory Peck in John Huston's film of Moby Dick. Peck's towering performance in magnetic presence personified for this teenager all the great acting, Hollywood glamour, and movie stardom seemed to be. And once Ahab had gone down with the whale, waving his arm for the world to follow, or maybe it was the other arm, who remembers? <laughs> Actually, a moment that doesn't appear in Melville's book. And Ishmael was safely floating on his coffin. I sat in the emptying cinema, watching until the very last credit rolled. And then dazed with what I'd seen, I walked out into the west riding darkness, overwhelmed with emotions and with a deep longing and ache in my heart, which at the time I did not understand and could not name. I waited for my bus, filled with confusion. What must it be like, I wondered, to be Gregory Peck or Captain Ahab? I bought all the film magazines, but their gossip and their posed photos didn't give me what I wanted. What did it feel like? I agonized to be an actor of such distinction, gravity, and absolute gorgeousness. <laughs> and how cruelly aware I was of the distance that separated this enthusiastic Yorkshire working class amateur th thespian from Oscar winner Greg Peck. All right. So let's leap forward now, 43 years, <laughs> to 1997. And I am aboard a mock-up of the Pequod in a huge water-filled tank beside the ocean in Victoria, Australia. I'm wearing a heavy woolen frock coat over the rest of a mid-19th century costume. Iron gray hair framing my deeply scarred face. And I'm haranguing a bunch of tough-looking sailors while moderately skillfully maneuvering on one good leg and one fake bone leg. The scene ends, the director calls cut and turns aside to give some note to the camera operator. And I lunge for the specially designed chair that enables me to rest between takes and I suck on a bottle of water. And then a hand touches my arm a figure is leaning over me, and a familiar and beautiful voice is murmuring, You see, Patrick, you've got Ahab's voice. I never got the voice. <laughs> yes, indeed. Gregory Peck has been sitting behind the camera watching this afternoon's work. He's with us in Melbourne waiting to do his one day of shooting on Moby Dick, as Father Mapple, and he and I had already spent many hours talking about Ahab and Greg's experience on the John Huston film. He told me he didn't want to play Ahab, that he thought he was too young, too inexperienced for the role. But the studio made him, they could do that in those days. Actors were under contract. He told me how Huston never gave him a single note of direction. 
but he had ridden him hard, often publicly humiliating him. How Houston spent all his spare time drinking champagne with the glamorous and often shady people he invited to the set every day. How Orson Welles had patronized him and how he nearly died in the Irish Sea when the tow rope pulling Greg and Moby Dick broke and the crew boat lost him in the mist. Apparently they were only shooting in the entirely inappropriate Irish Sea because John Houston wanted to go hunting on his estate in Ireland every weekend. Greg had been modest, charming, warm and encouraging from the day he had agreed to meet with me to talk about the role. He'd even asked if he could be in the movie and play Father Mapple. This was a made-for-TV movie, you understand. None of us would have had the nerve to invite Gregory Peck to play a one-scene role, but he wanted to do it, and he later told me it was to get his revenge on Orson Welles. <laughs> whose performance as Father Mapple he'd not liked. And he had a feeling he could do it better. And I went to watch him work that day that they were shooting the sermon, and in take after take, Greg was awesome. But even so, and despite the spontaneous applause that broke out each time he went perfectly all the way through that long sermon, he asked me in a tea break, if I had any thoughts about what he was doing, did I have any suggestions? And the wide gap of space, time, and credibility that separated the Soldo Cinema Dewsbury from Hollywood disappeared. Well, to answer Mr. Sondheim's question, there's documentary evidence that in 1950, I played a character called Tom of Towngate in a Murfield Whitson pageant. And I do have a folk memory of being somebody in a Robin Hood play at school around the same time, as well as a chorus member in the church pantomimes. <laughs> if, by the way, any of my family had been destined for fame and fortune, it would have been my brother, Trevor, five years older than me, much more talented and certainly better looking, and still remembered locally as a dashing buttons in Cinderella. <laughs> and we were not the only thespians in the family. My mother, Gladys, was a member of what would now be considered a very modern and experimental group of performers, the Old Bank Methodist Women's Theatre Group. They put on plays twice a year, and not merely plays written for women, but conventional plays with male characters. And in this company, there were members of the congregation who specialized in playing the male roles, who cut their hair and affected a mannish walk and voice. Now, my mother didn't want a lot of acting responsibility. She had trouble remembering her lines, and so she only took very small roles, the butler, the maid, and so forth. And I knew that she kept her script in the wings and would always check her lines before entering. Therefore, it was no surprise to me, though no less delightful, that one night I saw her enter a scene as a maid carrying a tray and hear her say, enter Mary with kippers. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in looking at her script in the wings, in the dark, she'd read the stage direction. Well, I was precocious enough at the time to assure her that what she had done was very Brechtian. <laughs> Which reminds me of one of my favorite lines, if not the most favorite line in any modern play, in Christopher Hampton's play, Tales from Hollywood. A character, having just finished a scene with Bertolt Brecht, turns to the audience and says, Brecht always loved to be reminding audiences that they were in a theater. Where the hell did he think they thought they were? <laughs> of course, it had to be that all this acting talent in my family, my father, Alfred, was a great storyteller. It had to come from somewhere, but I was 20 and already a professional actor before I discovered the source. My grandmother in her 80s and not much longer for this world, she died the following year, summoned me to her side 
at her home in Blackpool. There she told me of her husband, William, a man never spoken of in my family. He had deserted her and their, and their four children just about the turn of the century and disappeared to London. He'd been a stage carpenter in Tyneside, but had turned actor in the metropolis. The last time he was heard of, my grandmother told me, was when the police had gone to arrest him for desertion of his family and failing to pay support money when he was appearing in a play at the Elephant and Castle Theatre in London, since destroyed in the Blitz. Two policemen collared him in the wings, but he persuaded them to let him finish his last scene. He said he would then come quietly. And what he did was to enter, play his last scene, then exit the other side of the stage, out of the theatre, <laughs> never to be seen again. <laughs> and I mean, never to be seen again. It was believed he took the course of many scoundrels and went to America, <laughs> forgive me, my American family. And it's just possible that when I passed through the United States with the old Vic Company in 1962, that William Stewart was acting somewhere in that great country, but I have no doubt under a different name altogether. <laughs> when I was 12, we'll now go back two years, my English teacher, Cecil Dormand, who I called earlier today and told him that his pupil was coming here tonight, he distributed to my class copies of The Merchant of Venice, Act one, scene three, he instructed. Stuart, you're Shylock. Read it. And I did. No, not to yourself, idiot, <laughs> said Mr. Dorman. Out loud, this is a play, it's not a poem. <laughs> and that morning, in room eight, at Murfield Secondary Modern School, I read Shakespeare aloud for the first time. Yes, I'm a modern school boy. Not an 11-plus failure, however. On the morning of the exam, walking to school, I came to a junction where to the right was Crowley's boys and the exam papers, and to the left, the road that led down into the town, across the river, the canal, the railway, and up into the hills, and without hesitation, that was the one I took. <laughs> and I spent a lovely day walking in the woods, eating my packed lunch, sitting against an old dry stone wall and looking down on the town and even the roof of my school where at that moment my pals were sitting their exam. Of course, there was a row. But as a result of my choice, I spent four marvelous years as a modern school high flyer, head boy, no less. <laughs> and performing Shakespeare out loud for the enlightened Cecil Dorman. And there were drama courses organized by the equally enlightened West Riding County Drama Advisor, where between the age of 12 and 17, 12 and 17, I played Oedipus Rex, <laughs> Leontes in The Winter's Tale, Prospero, all totally fearlessly and I'll come back to that in a moment. <laughs> there were also productions of the York Mystery Plays, Commedia dell'arte, and Victorian melodrama. Classes in design, costume, history of theater, movement, speech, Shakespeare. The fear came later, after my training at the Bristol Old Vic Theater School, and by which time I knew enough to be scared. And that fear stayed with me for a long time much, much too long. I was in my late thirties before I finally began to rid myself of fear. Now, please don't misunderstand me. This was not stage fright. I'd never had that. A brightly lit stage and a darkened auditorium, hundreds of people, sometimes thousands, and in the case of the Hollywood Bowl, 17,000 people looking at me. It was fear of revealing myself, my real self, exposing myself 
in my work. I did plenty of good things, wonderful roles in repertory with the Royal Shakespeare Company, but all the time I was hiding, hiding behind the characters I played, hiding behind wigs and beards and voices. And this was strange because at 12 years old, I had discovered what a safe place the stage was. Planned, organized, rehearsed, predictable. Unlike my home life, which was for most of the time, none of these. So when I met the brilliant director and thinker, Ronald Eyre, and he asked me to play Leontes for him in The Winter's Tale, a grown-up Leontes this time, I was already desperately searching for a path out of my inhibition and into a different way of working. Actually, I didn't want to do Leontes. It's generally thought of as an actor's graveyard of a role. So vile and cruel, utterly without sympathy, until perhaps the last scene of the play. I know of no actors who have made a name for themselves playing that role. However, with dazzling analysis, Ronald Eyre talked me into it, and furthermore, insisted that the role would only work if I found this unhappy, tortured individual inside myself. And without knowing it, this was, of course, what I had been searching for. But I could not have done it without Ronald Eyre at my side, ready to catch me if I should fall, and urging me always to dig deeper and take bigger risks. My then wife was the choreographer of this production, and she had seen none of the rehearsals of the Leontes scenes. When we were about to start our first run through, I glanced over at her sitting behind the production desk, and I felt a great swell of pity, because she had no idea of the existence of the murderous, cruel, chaotic monster who was about to walk onto that rehearsal room stage. And after that, of course, there was no turning back. There was no retreating into impersonation. And luckily, the roles followed that encouraged and supported this kind of approach to my work. And it can be taken too far this approach, of course it can. A friend who saw The Winter's Tale several times commented that I might have had more popular success in the role if the audience had not felt that what they were witnessing was altogether too private for public consumption. He said to me, when your Leontes is on stage, we actually want to look away. Well, of course, that won't do. There's no point in spilling your guts if the audience doesn't care to see it. But better that than concealed in fear and insecurity. There are many qualities of fear for an artist, but the most debilitating is the fear of failure. In my last term at drama school at Bristol, my principal called me to his office one day and said to me, uh, well, he said many things that were hard for me to hear. But the final thing he said to me was, Patrick, you will never achieve success by ensuring against failure. Yeah, I understood it. You all understand it too. But it took me maybe 20 more years for the real significance of what he'd said to sink in. Winston Churchill, who perhaps even stood where I am standing now. He did. Wow. <laughs> Winston Churchill said, it's my favorite of many brilliant sayings from that man, he said the greatest virtue is courage because it makes all the other virtues possible. I'm fascinated by this fear. I'm fascinated by this terror that can paralyze so many of us, no matter how we live and what we do. Not too long ago, Simon Hatterstone wrote about it in The Guardian. 
But this article was about sportsmen and about choking. Those times when perfected and familiar physical actions suddenly become strange, awkward, and naive. Anyone can experience this in commonplace day-to-day -day activities, but Hatton Stone's piece focused on this phenomena in a sporting context, and especially when medals, championships, towering careers were at stake. He examined historic moments of inexplicable misjudgment and complete wackiness, asking some of the unfortunate individuals to explain what was going on and what were they feeling and thinking. Well, to a, a sports fan like me, this was fascinating. But why was it also making me very uncomfortable? It's because, of course, actors experience it too. In fact, Unlike the sudden penalty shootout ineptness, the baseline meltdown, or the 18th fairway craziness, we experience it as a career-long option. A seductive specter, always lurking at one's shoulder. I first met it when I was standing alone on the stage of the Bristol University Studio Theatre in 1958. I was playing the narrator in Dylan Thomas's masterpiece, Under Milkwood. The house lights had gone down, resulting in blackness. And then a pinpoint spot lit my face, and only my face. And everyone waited to hear that famous opening line, to begin at the beginning. But I froze blinded, only aware that two and a half hours of talking lay ahead of me, and I didn't know what the first line was. And time passed, and then I heard a voice, the voice of my director, Duncan Ross, somewhere in the audience, shout out, Patrick! <laughs> and in that moment, I was more afraid of him than I was of the audience. <laughs> and I was away, running, two and a half hours, went by in a flash. Afterwards, a teacher commented that the, the bravest moment of my performance was the challenging silence with which I began. <laughs> and, <laughs> I think it was then that I learned, but failed to incorporate in my work for decades that if you're smart, the audience will never know the difference between life and acting. And I galumphed and cavorted through five years of provincial theatre, hardly believing that somebody was paying me to do this job. And then I joined the Royal Shakespeare Company, and then, oh dear, was I in trouble. <laughs> These were seriously brilliant people. Peter Hall, John Barton, John Burry, David Warner, Elizabeth Spriggs, Ian Holm, Janet Sussman. It was time for me to buckle down and stop just having fun. And it was also time to re-experience that under milkwood terror. How often in the years that lay ahead did I say to myself, well, on that stage in Stratford-on-Avon, all right, Patrick, I'll just say the next line and then I'll put an end to all of this. I'll turn to the audience and I'll say, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, I'm leaving now. <laughs> but very shortly, someone will come on to take my place and the performance will continue. Good night. <laughs> and I'd walk out into the dark and just disappear. I really don't know why I never said it. I swear the words were on my lips so many times. But I kept on going and going. Perhaps that was the most contemptible fear, not being brave enough to say those words. This afternoon, my son, who is an actor, told me a story told him by the wonderful actor James Hayes about one afternoon in Stoke-on-Trent at a matinee of Toad of Toad Hall. Ratty and Mole and Badger <laughs> were waiting on stage for Toad to come back from his trial. And when he arrived, he was breathing very shallowly, hyperventilating. And first he went to Ratty and put his hands on his shoulders and stared into his face and didn't speak. 
and then he went to Mole, and then he went to Badger. Clearly, he was in some state of panic. The actors began to improvise, but the actor playing Toad looked around, looked at all of them, and simply jumped off the front of the stage, out through the middle of the audience, <laughs> and into the high street of Stoke-on-Trent. <laughs> Running. Well, uh, Jimmy Hayes followed him out into the street and could see down the high street the shape of Toad of Toad Hall <laughs> running and waddling down the street. And at that moment, Bob Hoskins showed up, a very much younger Bob Hoskins, who had been playing the judge. And he said, what's going on? And they said, it, it's, it's Toad. He's run off. Look, he's down the street. And Bob Hoskins said, leave this to me. And he took off after him. And after a couple of hundred yards, brought Toad down with a rugby tackle. <laughs> Saturday afternoon in Stoke-on-Trent. <clears throat> and he pulled this guy up, dragged him to his feet and said, you're coming with me. And he hauled him back into the theatre and pushed him onto the stage. And for the rest of that day, afternoon and evening, whenever Toad was on stage, there was Bob Hoskins standing in the wings going... <laughs> The first time I experienced it in another actor was at the Sheffield Playhouse in the middle of a long scene of exposition between myself and another actor. And suddenly, the actor turned up stage, looked at me and murmured, help me, <laughs> help me. And I, a beginner, right out of training, could only stand and watch him fall apart. And years later, with the Royal Shakespeare Company, a great and brilliant leading actor stepped onto the stage with a company of about 18 of us already there, and very quietly said, it's no good. It's no good. Stopped talking and didn't speak again on a stage for 12 years. Some actors are brave. <laughs> Only a very few years ago, a star actor at Chichester, who had been struggling with his lines through rehearsals and into previews, during one of the final previews, he suddenly turned to his fellow actors on stage and said, I'm just going to put the cat out. <laughs> and walked off. <laughs> and never came back. There's a famous incident written, written about by the reviewers because it was an opening night at the Barbican when an actor forgot his lines but kept trying to paraphrase his way back into the speech. It didn't work. And so he turned to the audience and he said, all right, we're going to start the scene again from the beginning. And to the confusion of the other actors, they did. They went back and they started the scene again. They got to exactly the same place and once more he came to a dead stop. Then he walked off, but he came back, because he came back with the script in his hand. <laughs> this was a press night. <clears throat> he looked at the script, but I'm told that even though he would found the scene that they were in, he wasn't able to read the lines because he couldn't see them. He couldn't see them. I think that's the story that frightens me most, when the training, technique, talent cannot support you and even your eyes are no help. My apologies to those who've heard this story before. In 1966, there was a young actor at Stratford-on-Avon who was so inadequate, even his understudies were just two or three lines. He could barely even stand still and hold a spear. And it, it was perfectly clear to everybody that this was an actor whose career was going to go nowhere. His name was Malcolm McDowell. And two years later, he'd made If, and two years later, he made Oh Funny Man and uh, Clockwork Orange, and was to become the biggest English movie star of his time. Well, Malcolm was understudying a British soldier in Henry V. And uh, one of the principles was off, so there was this kind of domino effect, you know. Somebody's off, so everybody moves up one place, until it came to Malcolm, 
who was understudying the English soldier who comes to tell Henry before the Battle of Agincourt that the French are ready to fight. But they didn't have time to rehearse it because by then the audience were waiting to come into the auditorium. So the stage manager said, you know what goes on, Malcolm, you're on stage, aren't you, when this happens? You know, you come on, you kneel in front of the king, Ian Holm, playing Henry V, and you say your lines and then you step to one side and you all go off. Fine, said Malcolm, absolutely, I've got it, no problem, no, no, no problem at all. But all through that afternoon, we kept encountering Malcolm muttering in corners. The speech he had to say was actually quite beautiful. My gracious liege, bestow yourself with speed. The French are bravely in their battle set and will with all expedience charge on us. Good lines, those. The moment came and Malcolm ran on, knelt in front of Ian Holm and said, Come on, come on, they're coming! <laughs> I mean, as a paraphrase, it works, <laughs> kind of. But I don't know, something is missing. <laughs> so why do we put ourselves through all this? It can't be the pursuit of fame and riches, not at the Royal Shakespeare Company, or at the end of a career hoping to end up, I'm a celebrity, etc., etc. But a few weeks ago, I read something that gave me a glimpse of what artists are after. And I'm not uncomfortable in describing actors as artists. These are a few words from a man called Paul, Carl Paul Nuck. He is a pianist and he's director of music at Boston Conservatory. And he was welcoming a new class at the start of the academic year. And he said, one of my parents' deepest fears, I suspect, is that society would not properly value me as a musician, that I wouldn't be appreciated. I had very good grades in high school. I was good in science and math. And they imagined that as a doctor or a research chemist or an engineer, I more, might be more appreciated than as a musician. And they loved music. They listened to classical music all the time. They just weren't really clear about its function. One of the most profound musical compositions of the time, he said, is the Quartet for the End of Time, written by the French composer Olivier Messiaen. In 1940, Messiaen was 31 years old when France entered the war against Nazi Germany. He was captured by the Germans in June of 1940, sent across Germany in a cattle car and imprisoned in a concentration camp. He was fortunate to find a sympathetic prison guard who gave him paper and a place to compose. There were three other musicians in the camp, a cellist, a violinist, and a clarinetist. And Messiaen wrote his quartet with these specific players in mind. It was performed in January 1941 for 4,000 prisoners and guards in the prison camp. And today, it is one of the most famous masterworks in the repertoire. Given what we have since learned about life in the concentration camps, why would anyone in his right mind waste time and energy writing or playing music? There was barely enough energy on a good day, he writes, to find food and water, to avoid a beating, to stay warm, to escape torture. Why would anyone bother with music? And yet from those camps, we have poetry, we have music, we have visual art, and we have drama. It wasn't just this one fanatic messian. Many, many people created art. Why? Well, in a place where people are only focused on survival, on the bare necessities, the obvious conclusion is that art must be somehow essential to life. The camps were without money, without hope, without commerce, without recreation, without basic respect, but they were not without art.
Art is a part of survival. Art is part of the human spirit, an unquestionable expression of who we are. Art is one of the ways in which we say, I am alive and my life has meaning. He said to those students, if we were a medical school and you were here as med students practicing appendectomies, you'd take your work very seriously because you would imagine that some night at 2 a.m. someone is going to waltz into your emergency room and you're going to have to save their life. Well, my friends, someday at 8 p.m., somebody is going to walk into your concert hall and bring you a mind that is confused, a heart that is overwhelmed, a soul that is weary. Whether they go out whole again will depend partly on how well you perform your craft. Mark Twain said, when we remember we are all mad, the mysteries disappear and life stands fully explained. Thank you.